Okay, welcome back to RoboCup at Home Education. Um, today we have on this online classroom an invited lecture series. Right, uh, it is our great honour to invite uh, Team LASR from University of Leeds for today's presentation. Uh, and also welcome back and also welcome for all the audience that uh, first time joined this session. Okay, so let me start introduce ourselves. Okay, so today we have uh, this topic, Human-Robot Interaction Simulation in Ross Gazebo by our speaker team LASR from University of Leeds. So today we have Jared and also friends. Uh, later they will introduce themselves. Um, so I'm Jeffrey from uh, RoboCup at Home Education. I'll be the host again for today's session. So um, today's the presentation will last some um, estimate for two hours. So and in Asia is uh, 5.30 to uh, 7.30 and also in UK is uh, morning 10.30 to 12.30 right so uh, for further information please um, refer to our website so you can head over to our website over there uh, to see more information about um, this session and also uh, other uh, information on other uh, uh, other classes and also uh, materials for the previous class, right? So as a privacy reminder, uh, this whole session will be recorded and this video will be published online later on. So um, for all the audience and uh, other people that not involved in presenting, so please refrain from turn on your mic and also share your screen, right? Uh, you can do so during the Q&A, but we will uh, give you the indication that you can turn on your a microphone for the question and answer session later on right uh, but other than that you can also uh, contact us from the chat windows or you can send us email and other stuff uh, other channel to send us some um, any inquiry that you would like to ask okay so you are free to contact us uh, anytime before the Q&A and we will uh, do the question and answer uh, at the end of the presentation Okay, so please allow me about two, three minutes to uh, do the introduction about ourselves, uh, RoboCup at Home Education. So RoboCup at Home Education is an educational initiative in RoboCup at Home that promotes educational effort to boost uh, RoboCup participation and artificial intelligence focused service robot development. So currently under this initiative, we have four uh, active uh, operations. Uh, four main uh, efforts that uh, we try to promote. So the first thing is uh, we run this what we call RoboCup at Home Education Challenge uh, which is we have um, annually in International RoboCups event run in parallel and also we have also this education challenge in uh, various regional for example like Asia Pacific, uh, European and also national in um, RoboCup national level which is for example RoboCup Japan, RoboCup China and so on. So we uh, want to create this uh, educational based um, competition for to encourage beginner and also um, people that want to try on this uh, at home competition uh, to join and have uh, a platform to learn uh, while doing the competition. Okay, the second effort is this open source educational robot platform development. Uh, which is we try to gather all the resources, uh, technical resources, uh, knowledge and also experience from all our community uh, in uh, the teams that participated in our event. So we try to gather all these resources uh, to provide support, especially for beginner team or teams who want to try on uh, but cannot get um, technical support from other me, right? So uh, we try to gather all this uh, technical uh, support and also uh, put it in terms of uh, a training materials. So that leads to the third uh, effort, which is this open courseware. So we try not just to provide uh, this uh, materials or information in uh, using the open source uh, concept, but we also try to develop the training materials, teaching courseware, uh, which is we have this open courseware that available on our website for general public or whoever that want to learn about AI and also uh, service robot development. And lastly, we are actively trying to do an outreach program to 
the whole world so um, basically we don't limit to any boundary or any regions so any community out there uh, that um, listen to this uh, video uh, who want to know more how to actually bring all these resources to your local community please feel free to contact us because previously before this COVID we actually run a lot of local workshops uh, but now we also uh, will have a lot of resources to help you to run online uh, courses as well so please feel free to contact us so for more information please um, head to our website the link is over there uh, to see more information uh, all, all the things that I mentioned uh, previously you can find all the details on our website and also if you would like to interact with us you can join our Facebook you like our Facebook page and inside the page there is a Facebook group that you can join and talk to our community okay so I welcome you and lastly I would like to thank all our sponsors so RoboCup uh, Federation, uh, Massworks, Software and Robotics, Jupiter Robots and IEEE RAS for all the support financially and also technically uh, throughout this whole year for these uh, activities. Okay, and for this online classes, um, we, we started this online classroom um, this year uh, ever since the COVID uh, situation started. So we try to put everything online uh, to continue uh, AI and robotics learning. So to continue our mission and vision, so we put everything online and open for the public to, to refer. So um, under this uh, online classroom, we have this invited lecture series where we invite all the teams and also um, experts from various um, disciplinary to actually uh, present their knowledge and also their expertise in certain uh, domain particularly in service robot development or ai uh, research uh, to the general public okay the purpose is to let all of us have a chance to know uh, the know-how and also how to actually uh, develop ai and service robotics okay so this is the invited lecture uh, but for regular classes so if you interested to know more about how to build um, intelligent robots or service robot that use a lot of ai um, you can follow our regular online classroom track, which is over there. We have a six week um, introduction to service robotics, which is previously online, uh, but now you can find all the materials over there. And also, um, previously for our online challenge 2020, which is um, concluded at June, we actually have this uh, special online challenge track where we um, have a five week or six week of um, classes in uh, two different platforms to assist our uh, teams to develop. So everyone actually uh, learn from the uh, online classroom and then with whatever that they have learned, they join the competition. All right. so for more detail, please um, refer to the website. Okay. Right, so without further ado, I would like to invite our guest today. So team LASR. Uh, from University of Leeds and they are going to show you how to actually do human robot interaction in a simulation way and the platform that you use uh, is this Ross uh, Gazebo but of course they have more things to share with you so we would like to hear from you right so guys I will stop my uh, screen and please put up your screen okay Okay, so you can start by introducing yourself, then you can start your um, presentation directly. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're Team Laser and also we're representing all of the members uh, from our team that aren't uh, presenting this presentation. Uh, to be more accurate, we're Jared and myself, Juan. Uh, we're two beginners. Um, and we're going to share with you our experience and the progress that we made by attending RoboCup at Home Education. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, first of all, um, we will be doing introduction, uh, then we move on to motivation, our intro to robotics, how we started, uh, what do we use, our architecture, how does your system look like, um, then we'll talk about uh, RoboCup at Home Education Challenge, um, the competition, and final um, conclusion. Okay, can move forward. 
Okay, first of all, um, where's Leeds at? We're based at the University of Leeds, uh, one of the most historical and prestigious universities in the UK. Um, Leeds, Leeds is in the West Yorkshire in Northern England. Um, the University of Leeds uh, was established in 1831 as the Leeds School of Medicine and then officially funded as the University of Leeds in 1904. University of Leeds is uh, part of the Russell Group of prestigious uh, self-selected research associated across uh, the United Kingdom. And the University of Leeds is one of, uh, one of the only six original Red Brick Universities in the UK. The Red Brick Universities of the UK were originally a group of institutions that uh, were founded in major British industrial cities during the 19th century. Now, these images show some buildings of our campus and leads uh, on the map right there. Okay. Okay, uh, so now I'll talk a little bit about our actual, uh, our actual team. So, uh, first off, we have this uh, Sensible Robots uh, Research Group, uh, which is a research group led by Dr. Matteo Leonetti, uh, our lecturer and the team leader. And the goal of this research group is uh, building Sensible Robots. Uh, the research group revolves around robot behavior. Uh, they design systems and algorithms to bring useful autonomous robots in our everyday life, capable of long-term rational and adaptive behavior. So the laser group uh, leads autonomous service robots, which we are actually a uh, part of, is the practice and the implementation of the research. Uh, so a robot club was formed a couple of years ago by Dr. Leonetti, and then the laser team uh, was founded just last year. Uh, so the first competition that the laser team took part in uh, was the Cyrop Challenge 2019 and they came first in the uh, Deliver Coffee Shop Orders episode and then third place in the Take the Elevators episode. Uh, winning this competition, Cyrop, uh, helped the team qualify for RoboCup at home. And this competition was a starting point for the code base that we currently work on. So all of the programming that was done for the Cyro competition, we're still using this code now, basically. Uh, this picture is uh, from the actual Cyro challenge, uh, it's just an example. And we have a short video to play as well uh, of the Cyro challenge. So we'll turn our cameras off for a moment uh, while we play this. Okay. Okay, so this is just uh, an example of uh, Tiago, the robot that we use, uh, interacting in a real environment. So at the moment he's checking if there are any people at the table and what's on the table. So he's identified the objects on the table and he decides that the table needs cleaning as there is no one there and there's rubbish on the table. Uh, then he navigates to a table with people and he detects them. So he's detected both people. And now he's detecting what's on the table. So he's detected the objects on the table and he decides that the table doesn't need serving because they already have coffee, basically. And now onto the third table where he's going to do the same thing. But basically, this is just a short clip of uh, the actual winning project of this competition that we won before we joined the team, obviously. So the main purpose of this video was 
to show an example of Tiago, a robot, working in an actual environment, rather than simulation, which is where all of the work we have done is in, because we haven't had access to the robot. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about our motivation. So we'll turn our cameras back on just for this. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Juan. Um, I'm from Spain, and uh, I'm attending Leeds University, joint laser team. And why did I start robotics? Um, I started robotics due to my interest in machine learning. Um, very often, we we see all sorts of achievements in this field, that and that really pushes my enthusiasm to learn more about robotics and, and AI. And that's why I would like to contribute to the improve to the improvement of more robust and intelligent systems. Um, some uh, examples that uh, keep me uh, motivated are, of course, uh, Boston Dynamics, uh, the robots doing flips, um, open AI, self-driven cars uh, from Tesla. Um, those are very big uh, projects that um, motivate me. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Jared. I'm from Wales. I'm also studying at the University of Leeds, uh, doing computer science and uh, AI. Uh, so I'm really interested in uh, machine learning, uh, AI, and uh, autonomous systems such as you know self-driving cars and stuff like that. And um, I would like to be part of uh, the journey that the robotics industry is on in building more reliable, accurate, and consistently performing systems in comparison to what humans can do. And so, yeah, uh, for this reason, I joined uh, the laser team, you know, to try and help influence like people's everyday lives by developing robotic systems uh, that aid them in their everyday lives. So. Uh, now we're going to talk about our introduction to actual robotics, like how we got started and stuff like that. So now we're going into the more technical side of the presentation. We're going to turn our cameras off just so you can focus on what's going on on the slides rather than our faces. Okay. Okay, so uh, both of us joined Team Laser uh, during our first year. Uh, however, I didn't participate within the group straight away, uh, but I, I wanted to continue learning and developing my skills while I was home in Wales, uh, not at university due to the pandemic. So I began to participate in the team's meetings. And myself, uh, Juan, I began attending uh, some a few laser meetings in the first year, but I didn't start participating uh, straight away. and. Um, I started participating now that I'm at home online, same as Jared. Okay, so uh, when we were getting started with robotics and using ROS, uh, we didn't have to create our own environment as uh, the LACE team has their own environment they provided us with in the form of a singularity container, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. And this container contained all the dependencies we required uh, to get started working with ROS and programming a robot. Uh, and despite not being able to work in the laboratory, uh, we keep in communication as a team through Zoom. Uh, and it was suggested that we participate in the Robot Cup at Home Education Challenge. And we thought this was a good idea because it would allow us as beginners to progressively keep learning and applying our skills as we go on. Uh, so the first thing we did uh, in learning robotics was uh, we completed the ROS tutorials on the ROS wiki. Uh, these tutorials were a great introduction to ROS and they taught us a range of things including ROS packages, nodes, topics, services, parameters, and custom messages, as well as publishing and subscribing to topics. From these tutorials, we created our first ROS package, which utilized all the things above basically uh, to create a simple publisher and subscriber. And later on, we would constantly come back to the ROS wiki to learn more advanced stuff. Alongside learning from the Ross Wiki, we also attended the RoboCup at Home Education Lectures uh, hosted by Jeffrey Tan. This course gave us a great insight into the applications of Ross. Uh, we gained further depth to our knowledge on the basics of Ross and learned a range of, uh, diff of new technologies such as speech synthesis, speech recognition, RGBD sensing, image processing, and how to build SLAM maps and autonomously 
navigate these maps using the Gazebo Simulator. Following this lecture series, um, in order to really prepare us, uh, prepare ourselves for the RoboCup competition, uh, we completed introductory worksheets created by Joe Jeffcock, one of the members from our team. Um, these worksheets helped to build upon our knowledge further. They helped us to understand uh, topics, notes, subscribers, and publishers uh, further. They also helped us to uh, begin learning how to use uh, um, OpenCV and action lib infrastructures uh, with ROS. Um, for instance, uh, and uh, in one of the worksheets, uh, we had to convert a ROS image uh, to an OpenCV CV2 frame and display it uh, as, as an example from one of the exercises. Um, also, these worksheets uh, are linked at the end of our presentation in case anybody uh, would like to access them and and get more practice with his uh, ROS environment. They are not uh, Tiago specific, so they can be used in uh, any other robot. Uh, yep. Okay, so now we're going to talk about our architecture. Um, we'll start uh, for, uh, by um, letting you know what is a container, uh, the benefits of using a container, then what is in our laser container. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our environment, um, Tiago itself, the robot, and uh, our team. Okay, we can move on. Um, yes, um, so what what is a container? Um, to be accurate, we're using a Singularity container. Uh, Singularity is a free cross-platform and open source computer program that performs operating system level virtualization, also known as uh, container, containerization. Sorry for my pronunciation. A container is, or container image, is a simple file or a collection of files saved onto a disk that stores everything that you need to run a target application or applications. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here uh, we have a diagram of what a container would look like. Um, a container is a uh, a container or a container process is simply an isolated uh, standard process running on top of the underlying host's operating system and the kernel, but whose software environment is defined by the contents of the container image. So we don't mess up our own system. Okay. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the actual advantages of a container, so why we're actually using this. Uh, so, in terms of performance, uh, container-based applications have direct access to the host kernel and the hardware, so we don't need to run a whole second operating system to run an application. Uh, there is a lot of freedom, so we can bring our own software environment, which moves on to the portability of it. We can bring this software environment across multiple computers, so the applications running in containers can be deployed easily to multiple different operating systems and hardware platforms. We build this container one time, and we can run it on almost any system. It's highly compatible. It's built with open standards available in all Linux distributions. And uh, reproducibility, the package, com it packages complex software applications into easy to manage, verifiable software units. So basically, this container, uh, it ensures that we all have the same uh, dependencies and we can distribute, distribute this across all of our computers as a team. And it just makes uh, basically our lives a lot easier because we're not uh, struggling to install dependencies on our computer and stuff like that. We just launch the container, everything is there straight away. Uh, so now uh, I'll move on to talk about what's actually on our container. So the container specific to us. So the container we've created has most importantly Ubuntu 16.04. So our operating system, we have a ROS environment. It's a ROS melodic. Python 2.7, we have a Python virtual environment with uh, all our dependencies we need for Python installed in there. 
uh, we have OpenCV, and then importantly, we have MoveBase and MoveIt. And we'll talk a little bit about these later on. Okay, so now our environment. So the robot we're using is Power Robotics Tiago. And uh, as I said earlier, we were provided with a Singularity container, which was created by one of the members, uh, which includes you know, dependencies such as ROS and OpenCV4, which we just mentioned. And due to the pandemic, we don't have access to lab. So all, all of our work done is in the gazebo simulator, which is uh, the main thing you'll be seeing throughout this. And the group has already created a lot of packages, uh, such as a YOLO object detection server, which we'll talk about a bit later, a speech server, which is used for handling speech synthesis and recognition, which we'll also talk about later, and a deep sort package, package which uses custom weights and PyTorch for object tracking which is more related to what we are doing now than the actual RoboCup challenge. And uh, further technologies which we utilized uh, throughout our work uh, mostly include OpenCV, Point Cloud, Dialogflow, and Smart. And all of these, they're like garbage terms at the moment. We're going to describe each of them in depth later on. And the majority of our program is done using Python. However, some of the existing packages within the team were created using C++. So there's some of that as well. Okay, so moving on. Okay, uh, let's see uh, a little bit about Tiago's hardware. Um, we use an RGBD camera. Uh, it's an Asus Xtion Pro camera. Um, Tiago has a stereo microphone. The speaker below, uh, below the microphone. Um, then we have a gripper. Um, Tiago could also have a five fingers hand, uh, but we have a gripper and we are starting to use it now. Um, then uh, also we have a seven degrees of freedom arm, which means in how many ways uh, we're able to move Tiago's arm. Uh, the torso, very important because it lets us uh, reach higher or lower. Um, then the dock station connector and a laser range finder, which uh, can go up to 25 meters. Okay, uh, moving on. We have a video of Tiago uh, showing you how he moves. And he's waving. So you, sh so you can see all this, those seven degrees of freedom. Okay, okay. so... Uh... Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how our team actually works. So we've talked about uh, the environment we're using, you know, a bit about our architecture, but now we're gonna talk about how we work as an actual team. So we have weekly meetings where we go over the goals that we've set previously and discuss uh, what they are and how we can improve them and any progress we've made. And during the meetings, we assign and divide new tasks and help is assigned uh, when and if it is needed. So normally a PhD student coordinates the whole team where the more senior members of the team act as supervisors aiming to provide a hierarchy of mentors. So the group ranges from first year undergraduates, which is us, uh, to postgraduate PhD students. And this range provided a really good learning environment for us to know members. So uh, we were mentored by a second year undergraduate student, Joe, who we talked about before. And next year, we'll most likely mentor first year undergraduate students. So this is the hierarchy of mentors that we are aiming to achieve. So in regards to the RoboCup, mainly it was us less experienced members that participated and the more experienced members uh, took on more of a mentoring or supervising role with the aim of bringing us less experienced members up to speed with the rest of the team so we can continue working together. Yes, uh, at the university, we will go to the laboratory to test the new application uh, using the actual robot, Tiago, but due to the current situation, the pandemic, uh, we still work together, like in a lab, even though we're distanced. We use technologies uh, including such as Zoom, um, Discord, and WhatsApp. For instance, we have a WhatsApp group containing all members uh, where we can go to if we need help on any topic. Okay, next slide. Yes, now we'll begin um, talking uh, talking to you through our RoboCup at Home Education 2020 Challenge. We'll start doing small introduction, then talking a little bit about the 
different tasks that involve the challenge. I'll carry my luggage, receptionist, and find my mates, and then the finals. Okay, so just a small introduction. Um, so the RoboCup at Home Education Challenge this year was uh, Man Kwan's very first competition with laser. And the preliminary tasks were divided among the members of the team, and we created packages for each of these tasks where all the requirements and dependencies were met. For the preliminary tasks, we worked together uh, with uh, other person, and we worked on the task Find My Mates. Um, the breakup of this task was guided and supported by another member of the team that we mentioned before, Joe. Uh, within this group of three, uh, we, split, uh, we split the workload and constantly communicated on what we were working on and the progress that we made. For certain sections, uh, we all worked together, particularly implementing the state machine. Uh, so regarding the final task, um, I worked with another member on the autonomous navigation uh, required for the task. And I worked with another member to implement gesture recognition and the, and the creation of uh, new models on Gazebo Simulator to, create, to recreate the task scenario. So um, this is uh, just a screenshot from our Carry My Luggage task. And basically this task involved detecting a selected person's bag, taking that bag, and then following the operator to the outside of a preset arena to a car, and then following this, returning to the original location. And this screenshot just shows uh, the environment, basically. Okay, the receptionist task. Um, in this task, the robot uh, waits for two guests. Uh, first, he receives the first guest at the entrance of, of a living room. Um, he needs to record the face features uh, to remember the guest. Once uh, he met the guest, um, he goes inside the living room, finds an empty seat for the first guest, and then com comes back to the door. Once the second guest is received, and uh, same, uh, Tiago analyzes the second guest, finds an empty seat for the second guest, and introduces the first guest to the second guest. And this is a screenshot showing uh, how was uh, the scenario and the environment. Okay, so now we're going to talk about where most of the stuff we did, and this is where we're going to go the most in depth. So, like we said before, we worked on Find My Mates together. And within this task, the main goal uh, was to detect guests, navigate to them, get the description and their location, and then return to the operator and relay the information to them. So, we decided that the following we would collect as a person's description. Their name, their height, their shirt color, and their hair color. And in terms of the location, we reported objects that they were within uh, a 1.5 meter radius of. So I personally worked on getting the person's height, uh, the location relative to the map, and then any nearby objects. And I worked on uh, navigation and set up the state machine up to a point where everybody could test. Uh, and uh, another and member worked on getting the person's hair and their shirt color. Moving on. Okay, so this is the Find My Mates uh, small content slide that we're going to show you so we don't lose track of what's going on. Um, first, we'll talk about uh, state machine. What is a state machine uh, and what does it look like? Uh, then we'll go into uh, Find My Mates. Um, task on showing you how we detected the people and what tools we used. Uh, similarly, uh, getting a person's name, how did we do that uh, for location and the height of a person, and also for a person's hair color, so basically the description, what, uh, how did we do that, uh, detecting nearby objects and navigation, how was that done. All right. So 
we'll first talk about uh, the state machine. So our state machine uh, was composed of six states. Uh, so the first state was a uh, wait for order. And you can see this on the diagram uh, on the right hand of the screen. And in this state, it's the default state of Tiago. Yeah, he will wait for a spoken command to be issued from the operator. Uh, for instance, in this task, it's find my mates. And once he receives that, he will start executing the task. So he transitions to the next state uh, to inspect the room. So in this, we navigate to predefined points on the map and then transition to the next state to detect the guests. So after arriving at the point, uh, he detects if any guests are in the field of view. If a person is detected and they have not previously been interacted with, uh, we'll navigate to them. And then we transition to the introduction. So when we arrive at the person, Tiago will introduce himself and request the person's name. And then we do some calculations to get their height, their shirt and hair color, and we identify any nearby object. And then we transition to the go to operator state, where Tiago will navigate back to the operator, which is another predefined point on the map. And then we will execute the make report state. So Tiago will report using speech synthesis, uh, the description of the person to the operator. Uh, so that's, uh, if everything goes right, that's the flow. But if things go wrong, for instance, if we are inspecting the room and we've already gone to all of the predefined points on the map, uh, we'll just end the task. Uh, or if we get to the operator and after we report about the person, um, we've already reported three people, then we will also end the task. So it's not just one line straight down. There are a lot of things that can happen that depends uh, which transitions we make. So the different outcomes decide which transition we make from each state. Uh, so for our state machine, uh, we used a technology called SMAC, which is a task level architecture designed for rapidly creating complex rural behavior in ROS. So it is used mainly to create and build hierarchical state machines like we just sh showed on the previous slide. So a state machine, what is it? It is a behavior model uh, based on input and the current state uh, it makes transitions and outputs are produced. So why are we using a state machine? Well, it accommodates for maintainable and modular code. For instance, if we want to change something in our program, we don't have to change a lot of things. We just change the particular state that it relates to. And we also use it as it makes complex tasks easier to prototype, debug, and maintain. So like I just said, if we want to change something or if something is going wrong, we can easily see where it is happening uh, from the output we get from Smack. So, uh... Okay, um, we wanted to show a, our RQT graph of what was going on when, uh, at runtime, but it was huge and many nodes and services. So we decided to make our own RQT graph uh, to show you what nodes uh, we were mainly using, apart from move base and the rest of them. Uh, in the middle is, in green, our state machine. Uh, we requested calls from YOLO detection server, also from our speech server for speech um, synthesis and recognition. Uh, and also, uh, when we were doing the hair and shirt recognition of the colors, we used another server to request the call. But that server also had to request a call to the face detection server, which is in yellow. And that would make, uh, that would be all the nodes that we use for our state machine, apart from uh, standard nodes. Okay, so now we're gonna give a breakdown of the task. So we'll go through each uh, subtask of the actual task, and we'll show what you're trying to achieve uh, and then we'll explain how we did it and the technology to be used. Uh, so first off, it was detecting people. So we have a short video here just to show... That's really loud. Sorry. Uh, just to show Tiago uh, detecting a person. So if you look in the bottom right, uh, this is the output from Tiago's camera showed in an open CV frame. So he sees the person, he detects them, and then we navigate to them. 
So this was one of the key things of the task. And as you can see also, we detect the face here. There is a bounding box drawn around the face. So how did we do this? Okay, so. Okay, there we go. So the first thing we need to do uh, to detect people is we get an image from Tiago's camera, which uh, Juan explained about earlier what the camera is. And then the form of this image is a, a ROS, a sensor messages image, and we convert this to an open CV image uh, using CV Bridge. And I'll explain about open CV after. Uh, so we have a, a YOLO detection server running in the background, which I'll also explain about after. And we pass the CV image we created along with the data set we want to use, which in this case is Coco, uh, and a confidence threshold and a threshold for non-maximum suppression on the bounding boxes. So an image is returned with bounding boxes drawn around each detection and an array of detection messages is also returned. Uh, a detection message is a custom message we have created ourselves and it contains the name of the detection, for example, a person, the dimensions of the bounding boxes drawn around the person and the confidence of the detection. And the confidence refers to the le leniency of the detections and non-maximum suppression is used to make sure we only detect each object once. We don't, it means we don't draw like a hundred bounding boxes around one person, for example. And here we have just a small diagram to show what we give to the YOLO detection server and what it gives us out. So you can see we pass the image, the date, the set name, the confidence, uh, the non-maximum suppression threshold to the detection server, and we returned the image with the bounding boxes and an array of detections. Okay, so now I'll talk about YOLO, which I've just mentioned. <clears throat> so what is YOLO? YOLO, it's a stands for you only look once. It's a real-time object detection system. Uh, so what happens within YOLO is a neural network is applied to our image, um, in this case, we use an open CV neural network, although at the moment we are working on moving it to PyTorch or TensorFlow so we can use GPU acceleration. Uh, the network divides the image into regions and predicts bounding boxes and probabilities for each region. And the bounding boxes are weighted by the predicted probabilities. So as I said on the last slide, we use weights and classes from the COCO dataset. Uh, COCO stands for common objects in the context. Uh, COCO is a large-scale object detection, segmentation, and captioning data set. So we have a server which we keep running in the background for virtually all of our tasks, which continually uses YOLO and publishes any detections that we get. So we use YOLO for both people and object detection. As you can see in the image here, uh, it detects uh, a lot of things. So you can see it's detected a person, uh, objects such as cars and bicycles, and stuff like that. So we are constantly using this because it's so essential to all of our tasks. And uh, YOLO was created by Joseph Chet Redman. Okay, so now I'll talk about OpenCV, which I've also uh, previously mentioned. So what is OpenCV? Uh, OpenCV is a real-time computer vision library. Uh, we use it for image and video processing. Uh, it supports uh, GPU acceleration machine learning and clustering and one of the main things which is the main reason we use it for is it offers conversion between data types and messages within ROS. So like I said previously we use OpenCV to display our detections and to convert from a ROS sensor messages image to an OpenCV image which we pass to YOLO. So OpenCV uh, was created by Intel and Willow Garage. And now uh, that we showed uh, how did we do the detection on people and on objects, uh, we want to show you how did we uh, get the names of the persons. So this video is not from Find My Mates, however, you, we use the exact, exact uh, same speech recognition method. And this example shows Tiago getting someone's name and their favorite drink. Okay, so I'll play the video now. May I please get your name? My name is Joe. My own name is Joe. May I please get your favorite drink? Dr. Pepper. And your favorite drink is Dr. Dr. Pepper.
Okay, so... May I put... Sorry. Um, um, the speech synthesis and recognition package was developed by another member of our team. And we interpret and recognize a person's name using Bucket Sphinx and a dictionary of names, which uh, the tool itself, Bucket Sphinx, was uh, taught in the Robocop at Home Education and Online Lectures. Bucket Sphinx is an open source uh, toolkit for speech recognition. As I said, it requires a dictionary and also a language model file for, for its use. Um, this language model and dictionary can be built from a corpus file of sentences or keywords uh, that we want to use um, by using the online Sphinx uh, knowledge knowledge base tool. Um, as I said, we used a we used a corpus file of names to generate uh, this language model and and the dictionary. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, this uh, Pocket Sphinx uh, tool uh, was taught in the Robocop at Home Education Lectures by Jeffrey Tem and Jupiter Robot. It was actually developed by Carnegie Mellon University students. Okay. Okay, so now we have a short video. You can't really see much going on, but basically, this is Tiago detecting the person's height and getting their location on the map. Uh, as you can see, I don't know if you can see it, uh, in the terminal, uh, we see Tiago outputs uh, their height as 1.92 meters. And I had it muted, but he also does say it. Uh, I see that you are 1.92 meters tall, that is tall. Yeah, you can see that you are 1.92 meters tall. So, like I said, all the calculations are going on in the background, so there's not much to see, but we just wanted to show uh, it in reference to our task. Okay, so how do we get the location relative to the map and the height? So firstly, as I previously mentioned, we have our person detection. So first we use our YOLO object detection server to detect the person. Uh, so if we find a person, we wait for a point cloud 2 message from the camera's depth sensors. So I'll talk a bit about point cloud 2 afterwards. So we filter this point cloud to only contain points within the detected person's bounding box dimensions. And then from there, we get the center point from the point cloud, and we transform this to the map plane, giving us the coordinates of the person. And we do this transformation using uh, something called TF, which I'll also talk about afterwards. So from here, we can also get the height. We do this by getting the highest point from the cloud and transforming it to the map plane. And then we take the Z value and return it as the height. So we have an image here, uh, which we uh, have used OpenCV and CV Bridge, which I talked about earlier, to draw a bounding box around a person detected with YOLO. And also, I've used CV, OpenCV to draw their name, which refers to what kind of object they are. So in this case, they are a person. Uh, their X and Y coordinates relative to the map, and also their height in meters uh, has been drawn. So you can see that in the image. And obviously, this is from the gazebo simulation. OK, so now I'll talk about TF. So in the previous slide, I said that we use TF to transform uh, from point cloud to the map plane. So what is TF? It's a standard ROS package, and it allows us to keep track of multiple coordinate frames over time, such as a camera frame, like I've just discussed, and the map frame. So it allows us to transform points between frames, essentially allowing us to pick a point from one frame of reference and get that point in reference to another frame at the exact same moment in time. So we most frequently transform points from the camera frame to the map frame throughout our tasks. And the relationship between these frames is maintained in a tree structure buffer in time. So I have a diagram here just to show uh, that we can transform from the camera to a mountain point to a robot base. This is a very generic diagram. It's not specific to Tiago, but it's mainly just to show like the possible relationships we can transform between. Okay, so I mentioned point cloud two uh, when I was talking about uh, getting their location and their height. So this is a really complex message type in, in ROS. Uh, and a point cloud is a set of data points in space. Uh, it holds a collection of n-dimensional points, 
uh, the point data is stored as a binary blob, which is a collection of binary data stored as a single entity. The layout of the point data is described by an array of fields, and the point cloud data may be organized two-dimensional or unordered one-dimensional. So in our case, we use organized two-dimensional, which is image-like, and we get our point cloud data from Tiago's camera depth sensors, which I mentioned earlier. So there's an image here which shows the point cloud segmentation of a teacup. So you can see um, it's you can see that it's in uh, multiple dimensions. You can see the depth and it's almost 3D like basically. But yeah, this is a really complex data type and we're using it very, very frequently uh, throughout our ROS programming. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk about how we got the hair color and the shirt color. So the first thing that we do is once again, we use our YOLO, which we've talked about a lot to detect the person. And then we draw a rectangle at the top of their chest uh, use an open CV, which you can see uh, one of our members on the image, you can see the rectangle drawn. And then we use a face detection server, which uses an open CV deep neural network to detect the face. And we also draw a rectangle at the top of the face using open CV. And then we get the dominant colors inside the, these two rectangles using an algorithm called k-means clustering and a color determiner. And this gives us the color of the hair in the shirt. Okay. Okay, this video shows um, Tiago identifying nearby objects to the person in, all, in order to build a better context of their location and give a more precise and accurate uh, description of where the person is in the map. I will play the video. I think it's delayed a bit. Okay, so we see Tiago turning to the right of the person, and then Tiago also turning to the left of the person, basically looking around to detect those uh, nearby objects. Okay, so now I will talk about how we detected these nearby objects. Um, when we were facing the person, uh, we get an image from Tiago's camera and pass it to our yellow detection server. Um, then we iter iterate over the detections, uh, getting the location of the objects relative to the map using the same method as we get the location of the people. Uh, we calculate these, uh, the Euclidean distance of, the, of each object from the person and fil filter out any objects that are within two meters away from the person. Uh, then we repeat this uh, more times, uh, two, two more times, so rotating 30 degrees uh, to the left and to the right of the person uh, for these subsequent checks. Then uh, we consider the detected objects and report them to uh, add them we add them to the list to report them to the operator so he knows where his mate is okay talking about navigation um this is a, a video of tiago but uh i will explain first that uh our environment that the task take takes place within has been mapped with uh, using G mapping. So we have um, a map state of the environment. We selected predefined points, uh, as Jared mentioned before, um, on the map where Tiago navigated and set every point as checked. So he wouldn't repeat going twice uh, to the same location. Uh, for that, we use the ROS parameter server, um, which I will talk to, uh, in a bit about that. Um, and then we use uh, move-based goals to send uh, goal locations for Tiago to navigate to. And so this video uh, shows Tiago navigate, navigating from the operator uh, to a predefined location and then from there to a detected, detected person. Okay, so now Tiago is trying to find people. He detects one of the guests and approaches the guests. 
uh, it's important also to mention that uh, we had to be accurate about how far Tiago, like how close Tiago could get to the person, so we could keep uh, the person in the frame and get an accurate description of them. Okay. Okay, so uh, ROS parameter server that uh, we use a lot. Um, it is a uh, it is a shared uh, multivariate dictionary. Uh, nodes use this server to store and retrieve parameters at runtime. Uh, it contains a hierarchy of parameters that match the namespaces used for the nodes and the topics. Uh, these namespaces are represented as dictionaries or structs. And here, hierarchical design means that parameters can be accessed individually or as a tree. Throughout our tasks, we store custom data within dictionaries in ROS parameter server. Uh, this makes data, this data mobile and very easy to access. Um, the ROS parameter server is the lowest level of knowledge base, meaning that it's a technology used to store more, uh, complex structured and unstructured information. Okay, and move base, essential ROS package that we use for our navigation. Um, it provides an interface for configuring, running, and interacting with the navigation stack on the robot. Um, a goal in the form of move base goal, which, which consists of a target pose in terms of position and orientation. This goal is executed, is sent to a simple action server and is executed. And if it is possible for the robot to navigate to the goal position, then it will do so. Do so. Okay, so um, uh, Juan mentioned earlier about G-mapping. So first I'm going to explain about SLAM and then we'll talk about G-mapping. So SLAM. SLAM is a simultaneous location and mapping. It's uh, the computational problem of constructing and updating a map and keeping track of the robot's location within that map. So a map is needed for localization and a good pose estimate of the robot is needed for mapping. And this is why SLAM is hard because both of them go hand in hand. And um, SLAM is a really fundamental for robots to be autonomous. And it's been in research for a really long time, since the 1980s. And here we have an image uh, of SLAM, uh, SLAM map in Arviz, uh, which we use alongside Gazebo. It's very well-known uh, mapping service. Okay, so next we have a, a video. This is from, not our task, it's from the carry my luggage task. So. SLAM is not only essential for building a map to be used, but also for when we have a map, mapped area, but and when we go outside of this area. So we didn't use SLAM for this reason in Find My Mates, because we didn't go out of the arena. However, in Carry My Luggage, one of the requirements was to exit the arena and re-enter it. So, so SLAM was used there. So I'll show just a short video here. Ooh, that's loud. <laughs> So here, Tiago is exiting the arena. If you keep an eye on Arviz, you can see at the moment it's mapped out, but when we get to a certain point, it'll get to an area which is unmapped. So we don't know anything about it. And you'll see how uh, the map within Arviz is updated. So here we go. So here, SLAM is used right now uh, to build the map here as we are outside of the arena. Uh, so that's why SLAM is so important. So talking about SLAM uh, leads us to, let's play it again, leads us to G-mapping. Uh, so G-mapping includes uh, laser-based SLAM. Uh, it's a ROS package, very essential one again, and it's used to create a 2D uh, occupancy grid map from laser and pose data collected by the robot. So we use Arviz, which I just talked about, uh, which is a 3D visualization environment uh, to view the map that's been built using G-mapping. And G-mapping was one of the really important things that was taught in the RoboCup at Home education lecture series. So here we have a short video uh, just showing uh, G-mapping taking place and how the map is being displayed within Arviz. So if I play this. 
So you can see this is an unmapped arena. As Tiago starts navigating it, we use slam and gmapping to build the map which is being displayed within others. So after navigating through the arena, we build this map which we can then use and save to navigate throughout this map. Okay, so now we talk about uh, a lot of different things that a lot of subtasks that built up to the full time make task. So now we've talked about all them. I'm going to show you a short video just showing a section of Final Mates task where we put all of the things we've just discussed together into one thing. So you can see we have the Find My Mate. So Juan uh, issues the command Find My Mates. And you can see in the left, you can see in the left we have the terminal showing what's going on in the state machine. So Tiago goes to the predefined location to inspect the room. He detects the person and goes to them. I found you in this cube screen. The operator sent me to find you. May I please know your name? David. Get the guest name. Nice to meet you, David. I see that you are. We get their height. And their other information. So right now, as the calculations going on, uh, getting the shirt color, we just set their height, and now we're detecting nearby objects. I see that you are near the car and the chair. I see that your shirt is orange. I see that your hair is yellow. So now we have the information. Uh, Tiago is going to navigate back to the operator and relay this information. I So this is the go to operator state. We navigate back to the operator, and then Tiago is going to report the information we have. So that video was sped up a bit just to account for the real time factor because in simulation it's. I think it's about half the speed of what real life is. Uh, so yeah, that was the first part of Find My Mate's task. Uh, after this, it would repeat the same for any other guests in the room. Okay, so uh, now we are finished talking about uh, Find My Mates. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the actual final task. So. <clears throat> The objectives of the task was to serve food to a user and interact with a non-expert user naturally. And for this task, we chose the scenario of a coffee shop. So um, Laser already had a similar situation as seen before in the Cyro competition, which we showed the video at the beginning, where they won first place in the delivering coffee shop awards task. That was the video uh, that I showed at the very start, showing Tiago in the real environment. However, this time we made changes to the previous task and updated it. Uh, so I did say that the Cyrop challenge was the starting base for the code base that we're currently working on. So this code base, we've updated it now uh, for this. So the main change that we implement, implemented was to detect a waving person. And these people we identified as those who want to make orders. So we did this using open pose and you can see the open pose segmentation of the waving person uh, in this image on the right. And then we navigated to these people, uh, interacted with them using speech synthesis and speech recognition to get their order. And then we returned to a predefined location, which is a bar to collect their order. And here we wanted to implement Tiago's gripper to actually pick up the coffee cups, uh, but we couldn't get this working in time. However, at this point in time, now we can grip items such as coffee cups using the gripper. So instead of gripping for the task, we uh, move the objects within Gazebo and place them on top of Tiago, who then deliver them to the right people. So in this task, we were introduced to some new technologies. Uh, I mentioned OpenPose, which is a real-time multi-person system to jointly detect human body, hand, facial, and foot key points. 
So this was used for people waving at Tiago to be detected. Uh, we used another face recognition framework, which was created by a laser member, and we further used Pocket Sphinx. Uh, so now we'll talk a little bit about uh, our current projects in the bit. So I'll hand you back to Juan. Okay, yeah, so uh, where are we at now uh, and how, how far have we got, what have we achieved? Um, by now we've, we've been able to put together a, a system, an individual system recognition, uh, for, so that includes face, uh, clothes, F clothes detection, and also a speech recognition. We have improved our speech recognition system uh, using machine learning to extract uh, features of the voice of a person so that it can be recognized. So all of this put together, that, was, that way we can uh, identify people. Uh, we've also managed to get uh, detection of different poses from people. As Jared said, uh, people waving, uh, people pointing, and from those poses, uh, we can have Tiago perform um, different actions. Also, as Jared mentioned, uh, grabbing cups. With, uh, with a, we finally are able to use the gripper to grab any objects from a table. Um, also, we've been able to navigate through uh, the map by avoiding obstacles and including those obstacles as persons, uh, we can tell them to uh, gently uh, move out of Tiago's way so we don't have to go around them and recalculate um, and recalculate or what, uh, what's the best path to go. Um, and those summarize uh, some of our current achievements. Okay, so um, Juan has just told you about the current state of what's going on, and now I'll talk a little bit about the actual goal of LASER, what we are you know, working towards at the moment. So the end goal of this team is to have Tiago, our robot, actually serve people that come into the School of Computing uh, within our university. So we're trying to develop a framework to intelligently interact with people. So we started out from the bottom by recognizing people from clothes, face and voice that we've just discussed. And now we're working on person following, guiding and developing a, a dialogue system that uses both speech and a graphical interface. So we're in an effort to create a software structure and architecture that intelligently interacts with people and the components we've mentioned are all you know, in this direction. And one day we want person interaction to be as simple as navigation using Moonbase. So we are trying to make you know, person interaction with the robot to be you know, incredibly easy and simple and to really be extremely smooth. That's like the ultimate goal of our team. Uh, so now uh, we are taking questions, but also I want to mention first uh, that we have some links uh, within these slides if you want to do any further reading on the things we've mentioned. So there's a link to the laser website, the worksheets which we completed, which we discussed, uh, YOLO for object detection if you want to read about that, the Ross Wiki, uh, the RoboCup at Home Education Challenge Lectures, OpenCV, uh, CMU Sphinx for Pocket Sphinx, OpenPose, Singularity for Container, and Dialogflow for some speech stuff. Uh, so yeah, we'd be happy to take any questions now if there are any. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can't hear you. Sir, actually, uh, I come from Pakistan and uh, I want to know the scope uh, of these robots in, like, uh, in underdeveloped countries uh, where you know the labor is uh, very, very cheap as compared to the developed countries. So, uh, these robots are playing a significant role in developed countries. But uh, what do you suggest that uh, how can we, uh, like, uh, do you see any prospect uh, of uh, like these robots will be used in our underdeveloped country where labor is cheap? Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thanks for the question. I think like, yeah, there, there, there might be a lot of people that are asking the question, but maybe I, I put another perspective to ask this question, like how much 
your development actually independent from the real robot? I mean, like, can you do everything actually in the simulation model? Everything that we have discussed. Yes. So how, uh, how yeah. much dependent that your development is depend on the real hardware? So without the real hardware, you can't do it. Uh, what do you mean? Like all the things we've discussed, are they possible only yes. in real or in the uh, simulation? Which mean everything that you just discussed and all your development, can you actually yeah. do all this development solely on the simulation? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. We've only worked in the simulation so far. We haven't had, had access to the real robot. So, so all of this works yeah. in simulation. Oh, I see. So which means it is totally possible that for teams without Thiago hardware can actually reproduce what you have done and continue development uh, from where you have laid out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. Yeah. So I guess that is uh, something very uh, good information especially for teams that just want to start the development just want to know how is it without actually have the resources to get the real hardware because like not everyone have the luxuries to get the very expensive hardware and and i think like you have laid out a very nice fundamental uh, that you can actually uh, how to say develop human robot interaction and particularly in at home tasks that you actually showcase how we can actually achieve that in a purely simulation environment, right? Yeah, so I, yeah, I guess that, exactly. that actually answer uh, the question by, by the audience, uh, which is thanks a lot for the question. So I, I hope that give you the, some insight that you can actually work on ROS and also work on Gazebo and yeah, Today's presentation show you a way that we can actually do all these things totally uh, in a simulation model, uh, including the very natural human robot interaction. Right? Yes, okay. sir. Yeah. Much yeah. for the question. Right. Do you have any more question? Okay. Maybe um, I, I I continue with the question that I would like to ask. Like. I, I can see that there are many development in your teams. Um, may I know like actually how long your teams have this Tiago and how much development have been done before the recent competition? Okay, so I think, so as I explained at the start, there was the robot club before the team yes. was founded. Hmm. So I think Tiago has been at the university since I think 2017. 2017. Uh, so but the actual development on the robot for the team now, I believe it only began uh, last year for that Cyrop challenge. Okay. Which we about right. at the start. How, how big is your team? Like how many members? Like I, I know you are the new members. So uh, who, who are the senior members and how many of them? Um, okay, so there's uh, me and Juan, mm. who are now second years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And. Is it four third years, Juan? Um, it's yeah, third years, um, third year students and also PhD students. Okay. Maybe they add up to um, and six of them. Of six of them. And uh, two master's students as well. Two master's students. So you and then yeah. as beginners, mm -hmm. I would say about um, including everybody maybe around 10 people 10 people all right so i i think it's a very um, wonderful work it's uh, very amazing that just about 10 of you maybe like a few phd a few masters and and some newcomers and and just within two years uh you have developed quite a solid um foundation to to yeah to actually Mateo, you know, our lecturer Mateo, uh dr lenetti actually gave us, um, well, he was our um, lecturer in first year for one of our uh, classes. Okay. And so he announced that everybody could join later mm -hmm. uh, and start attending those meetings. So that was a great opportunity for us as a first year students to join a robotics club that is um, using such as uh, new technologies you know, uh, up-to-date technologies, mm -hmm. and also 
showing that first year students are able to do much than uh, other people think they're able to do. I see. All right. So I, I think like it will, it is very nice that, that your professor have prepared all the materials for you to learn, which you can actually pick up all these things even during first year, which is you still struggle with your studies and, and you can actually program the robots to do something. So it's, it's pretty amazing, but I'm not sure like how many uh, things in, in the materials that is currently available online or everything is actually within your, your groups or, or it's, a, it's a private, uh, how to say, it's a closed thing that within uh, your university or the course. Do you have any materials that actually uh, been put online for, for the publics to refer? Well, we have the worksheets. Okay, so that uh, is the first thing. Okay. But I think that's about it, right? Okay. Yeah, just the worksheets, uh, okay. Ross Wiki tutorials, and then, yeah, Robocop. Yeah. So maybe uh, later on, I will have a look on, on the worksheet and see how much this thing can be shared uh, among our community to see like how people that are interested in your work can actually know the inside that. So actually what exactly inside the worksheet that uh, make you learn. So you actually learn that uh, as your fundamentals and before you actually work on the robots, right? Okay, right. So I, I roughly got some idea and the whole architecture who actually like built, I mean like, is it a, a student effort or actually your professor also like work together with you and is this uh, part of a research work uh, that, that um, belongs to some projects within your your, your your team so or in in other words like your club activities is it solely more on robotics activities or it is actually linked with uh, some research project I'm not sure if you know <laughs> well there's the sensible robots research group which yes. we talked about at the start okay. mm -hmm. and that's the research based and our group is more like applying this research okay. into actual robotics applications. I see. I see. So those are the research uh, output from like the, all the PhD and master students that they maybe work on various projects and then what you what, what you guys do is like you gather all this uh, research output and put it on Tiago for the competition, right? So yeah, that's actually. Way, right? All right. Okay. Okay. Right, so and, and uh, okay, so if there is any question on the floor, like feel free to ask, or else I, I will continue with my inquiry. So a few things. So in the first um, few slides that you introduced the container, so is that the Docker containers that you mean? No, it's a Singularity container. It's not so, Docker. Okay, it's not Docker. It's it's a different system. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, Singularity. Okay. Which um, there's no cost at all using it mm -hmm. and free open source. Mm -hmm. Okay. So may I know that actually how much, because personally I never worked on a Tiago before. I don't know like what is available. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's their software open source because I know Ross and Gazebo is open source. So I'm not sure like how much I can tap into Tiago framework that what are the tools that they provide you so i'm not sure do you know like how much actually development is done within your group that is not from tiago and how much actually is from tiago do, do you know this not sure <laughs> oh, i'm not completely sure about that one okay um yeah okay it, it doesn't matter. So I, I, I assume like most of the things that you just presented is actually uh, your in-house work within your group. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is a very nicely craft uh, system that even beginners can actually do very uh, complicated stuff. Like you have the, the smash, uh, the hierarchical thing yeah. that maybe you no need to actually develop a lot of low level um, behavior, right? The robot behavior. Well, it's not like we get uh, the output from the research group and just apply it. Mm -hmm. We we also have to go through a lot of pain. Yeah, yeah, sure. From yeah, understanding yeah, things and yeah, a lot of uh, cooperation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, I can understand that because um, uh, 
from a stand, uh, from a student point of view, it's actually very hard to build everything from scratch. So yes. by by understanding an existing um, framework that is flexible enough for you to rearrange and reassemble, uh, to prototype the at home uh, task is actually very useful. That is what I, 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 I can because like for example like if you want to work everything from scratch and you want to try to put everything together, it is not that easy. And then you maybe need a longer time in order to do that. So that, that framework is available. And um, may I know like the, the resources or whatever that you have developed, is it part of open source? Is there anything within your teams that is open source? I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't think. It. Yeah, I don't think it is uh, open source mm -hmm. that we have open source stuff right now. But um, this, uh, as um, Jared uh, mentioned in the last slide for the goal of Laser, mm -hmm. um, we are currently develop this uh, higher level task framework to interact with people, similar to move based Rust package. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was commented in one of the laser team meetings that in the future uh, that might be an open source uh, package mm -hmm. or some tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not an open source tool, but we don't know yet. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. All right. So, so I understand. Like um, most of the at home team actually in at home is actually one of the main criteria in, in judging or, or in the open and they even have an award for open source solution uh, that encourage the team to open source some of the technology of course not your winning strategy but some common technology that people can use it for other development so I, I actually look forward like if you have anything but uh, currently, where do you put your code? Like, are you using GitHub or you have an in-house GitLab or something? How you actually manage your code? We use a uh, GitLab. Okay, so you're using GitLab. Okay, right. So yeah. you have your server and, and keep everything there. Okay, yeah. right. So it's um very nice uh, uh, presentation. And um yeah, so let's talk about like how your, how to say, how your team actually work on the at home. So uh, from from what I heard just now, like you got qualified for this year at home, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So which means like you are, well, you are going to join for next year, right? Okay, right. So that, that would be very nice. Uh, so for this, uh, may I know, do you have any like systematic um, um, mechanism among your group for the management? For example, like, um, for example, next year you will have new members come in and some of uh, the members within your team might graduate after this and then you need to have some knowledge transfer. Uh, of course, you, you show us the, the, the worksheets and, and all the things, but those require a lot of um, self-motivation or self-initiative to actually do the learning. So within your team, how do you actually manage all this uh, distribution of work or development among new member and old member and stuff. Do you have something systematic inside there that uh, that, that you implement within your teams for, for all this like team management or your professor actually do all this work? Well, we when we have these like weekly meetings or okay. fortnightly meetings, mm -hmm. uh, we'll discuss like, you know, what's going on, what we want to have. So say we pick a project, then we will split this project uh, among the group. Like people will volunteer, I suppose. Like we'll say, who wants to do this? And then, you know, people will come forward and say, oh, you know, we want to work on that. And then we go from there. But in terms of actually, uh, I think you're referring to like learning. Um, like we said at the start, we have like a mentoring hierarchy. So after someone, say people are going to graduate and, you know, leave the team. Uh, the idea is that, so now, okay, so we were mentored by like the second years and stuff and, you know, whenever we had problems, you know, we went to them, we asked, like, can you help us? And then hopefully the next year, we will be able to do the same for the new first years, okay. if they, the German team. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so we have to say that uh, these worksheets were created by a second year student. 
it wasn't these uh, weren't created by our our professor or a PhD student. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, I guess you guys are very motivated for for all this development and very self organized uh, to to make all these things work. Uh, so that leads me to another question: Is like how you motivate like. How much you actually feel that after you have learned through all this, it actually benefit and you can actually apply all these things to your studies? Or do you think like all this thing actually is part of the things that you want to study? How it relates to your studies in university? So, um, due to the pandemic, because we haven't... Uh, really participated in any um, laser activities until the end of the first year. Mm -hmm. So we don't know um, how much uh, this summer is going to impact us in our next year, so second year of studies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how do we keep motivated? Uh, we just don't stop learning new stuff and we see we can do more and more. So, like um, last week, uh, Jared and I were figuring out how how can we get an RGB image from a point cloud, and we can see those type of small achievements that we can put together and get um, greater things, and uh, and that's awesome. Uh, I think uh, next year will be even more fun. I don't know if Jared has anything to say about. <laughs> Um, basically, just it's a constant process of learning. I don't know. For me personally, I always want to keep learning like new things. So I think that's why the, I'm motivated to do this because while you're programming in ROS, you know every single time you do something, you learn something new. You know, mm -hmm. like. And also, I think. Uh will get even uh, more motivated when we're able to test these applications on the actual robot and not only the simulator. Yeah, yeah. So I understand the, the satisfaction of working on the actual robot and it works. Yeah, I understand exactly. that. I, say, uh, I, I was, I mean, like, I'm, I'm still building robots and I understand the assignment. Uh, but mm -hmm. um, my, my question just now is actually the purpose of asking the question is like, uh, I'm, I'm not sure because you are now still second year in your undergraduate, so it's still a long way uh, to talk about research and also your future career in research or robotic research and so on. But um, I, I believe you are in, uh, in the correct directions that um, what you learn is actually not just for academic, but it will be very useful for later on in your career. For example, like if you work on robotic related industry, and all this uh, uh, knowledge and skills that you have in ROS, uh, things that you know how to program an actual robot, these are all the very um, important skill set that not just uh, academic result uh, will help you, but this skill will actually help you in your future career if you work in um, robotic related industry as well. This is what I believe. Um, so that actually um, make me believe that um, student that work on robotics um, competition are actually not wasting time and actually you are equipping yourself with skill sets that will be very useful in your life later on so that, yeah, that is what me. yeah that, that is what I, I would like to know because like um, there are actually a lot of students that feedback to me some of the students they have different goals different motivations mm -hmm. and um, they might feel like um, their participation or they spending the time in this robotics research or competition might not be so helpful in their academic studies and, and so on. So it, it, it depends on your personal um, goal. And But I believe that both of you joining this robotics club is because like you, you love all these information uh, activities. So uh, by just working on the simulation, you actually have a lot of development and you actually enjoy that but hopefully next year so I, I believe you haven't really applied anything that you have developed on the real robot right up to now no we haven't. right so hopefully next year you're able to like apply whatever that you have developed on an actual robot and tell me that it actually um resemble what you have 
achieve in the simulation because in simulation and actual world there are there is still some differences i mean like you yeah. can actually have 100 percent identical uh, and that is actually the challenge always in the simulation like how high fidelity of uh, the simulation is required in order to have uh, acceptable behavior or acceptable result from the simulation that you're confident enough that when you apply in a real robot you get something very similar so i'm not sure but i believe tiago is a very stable um, system that whatever that you have achieved in, in, in ross uh, gazebo you can achieve very much similar in a real robot but of course for human robot interaction especially i, I believe like you haven't joined at home competition before right i mean the actual at home using the real robot right the, the yeah that, we yeah. haven't yeah so um, but based on the videos that you show just now, that is the actual environment and actual competition. And in actual environment and competition, uh, it is very much different from, from what you, you, you expect. So that is actually the real challenge because like your long-term goal is you want a robot that is highly intelligent enough to actually interact with random people, right? In your school. Exactly. Yeah. So it's something that a lot of things will be unexpected. Like you, you can't expect the behavior of random people that will do on, I mean like what, you don't know how they will react on your robots and so on. So um, my next question is like, um, in your development, you actually handcraft a lot of um, the behavior. For example, I, I see your hierarchical, uh, your flowchart of, of the behaviors and so on. So do you actually think of how to make your robot go one step above that able to learn? That's the first thing. Of course, we understand deep learning, machine learning, all those things is you learn from some data and, and so on. But what I'm talking about the learning here is more on learning something that you unexpected. For example, like uh, you might have, uh, maybe you don't design your robot to talk to someone other than the language that you design so if let's say someone that talked to a very different language that your robot don't understand how your robot will behave is oh. your robot is going to not doing anything or, or yeah so this is just an example i'm not asking you for, for an answer for that but um for social robots it is very important that um, you we have the mechanism for the robot to uh, to to how to say it, react on unexpected circumstances so so that is something that um, but of course i can also see like research paper that make the robot able to learn this situation to do the reporting and then you can you can actually improve the robot along the way so you can gather more information from the interaction and make the robot smarter and smarter as well and also uh, there are actually a lot of research paper talking about the robot supposed to ask for help. It's just like human being, like you have a human servant that they are, that given an instruction that the, the, the robot don't know what to do. Then for human being, we automatically we will seek for help, right? So um, the robot, um, is it able to have this high intelligence and so on? So the purpose that for me to ask this question is like, how much uh, work that we still need to put in or how far do you think that uh, for your current situation, the robots, the, 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 the platform or the design or the system design that you have now, how far do you think from this point of view to the end goal that you, you just said, like you want a robot that can freely interact with the audience, the, 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 the public? How far do you think that? Or, what do you think like the next development that you need to look into uh, to make the robot able to do that? Okay, this is just oh. a, a while, how to say, an open discussion that uh, I would like to ask for your for your opinion, right? Yeah. If you I think we are, yeah. I think we are quite far away from that <laughs> point at the moment, right. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, but for the next step in our development, well, at the moment, we are trying to I'm not really sure how to explain it, but for instance, right now we are working on person following okay. and like following a specified person. Mm -hmm. So I suppose here we are dealing with unexpected behavior. For instance, if the person, you know, disappears, like where did they go, mm -hmm. you know, like around corners and stuff like that. But 
on a whole, we haven't really dealt with that much unexpected behavior yet, apart from, I suppose, in our dialogues. For instance, if uh, Tiago, for instance, in the coffee shop scenario for the final task, uh, I believe if uh, we don't get an expected answer or an intended answer, uh, then Tiago will ask them, you know, again, I, you know, I don't understand, you know, answer this, please. That sort of thing. But at the moment, we are not equipped really to deal with any unexpected behavior, I suppose. But that is somewhere, obviously, we would like to get to at some point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very complex uh, question yeah. to answer. Uh, and we always try to uh, keep that uh, unexpected behavior in every task. That we that we work on, but uh, yeah, human behavior can be sometimes uh, um, really unexpected. Maybe I mean, like human uh, can be mean to the robot. Actually, there are there are many research study that say that the robot. I mean, I, I don't know. I saw that paper in 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 presented by some Japanese researcher that say. If you really put a robot in a public place, uh, a lot of people, especially kids, will try to abuse the robot by like tapping, holding, moving, and try not to follow what the robot say. So that is that is actually a playful behavior of the public uh, towards something that they feel like um, not normal. Like the robot is not a norm in in their daily life. So. They, they might try to abuse <laughs> or try to be mean uh, or try to say something very different uh, from what the robot asks but that that is something um human nature uh that, that that the robot might take a long time to actually get used to that yeah. but of course mm -hmm. i i think like this 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 question might be a bit too far from from you guys so maybe i, I just come back a bit um uh, would like to ask some question about um so just now you talk about the coffee scenario and but your long term goal is like the freely uh how to say uh interact with the public but um currently do you ever think of a specific scope for example like make tiago as for example a waiter in, in the coffee shop so that is something very close scenario that you can actually eliminate a lot of unnecessary expectation uh -oh. Do you actually we have, with this? Uh, yeah, we have actually discussed in the meetings that mm -hmm. um, we want to be, um, be Tiago to be useful for students and mm -hmm. people in general. So we were thinking of uh, giving Tiago, uh, so to utilize Tiago in the School of Computing okay. um, mm -hmm. to perform uh, some actions or tasks or provide help to students um uh you know like if you don't know where you're at maybe you can ask tiago um where am i at uh, where can i go what path should i take to go to school of business i don't know um but we want to give tiago um we, we want our goal uh for next year would be to use Tiago in the School of Computing. Which means you try to make the robot more useful, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. more useful and so, then, yeah. So that's why interacting with people and start um, to get that feeling. Uh, maybe from there we can get unexpected uh, behaviors that we can um, start um, managing, you know, yeah yeah on top of that um mm -hmm. uh so at the moment we are working on a lot of uh small things i suppose with the goal of putting them together to do something like this so like you said we want to develop things uh and task. we want to develop tasks and actions that for instance if we are given a scenario like you just said the wait scenario mm -hmm. we can just be like okay so we have all of these things already we just need to put them into you know a state machine for example yes. and then that's the task mm -hmm. so like we're working on following at the moment someone's working on obstacle avoidance mm -hmm. 
we want to be able to have like modularity so we already have the things we just put them together to create uh, a task to match the scenario we're given if you get what i'm trying to say yeah so you you try to how to say uh cut smaller pieces yes so that you can develop like specific on certain thing then later on you can put that as uh, your behavior tree in into your behavior tree and then later on you can uh how to say reassemble reassemble all the yeah. subtasks in order to achieve a, a bigger goal yeah so i i guess that yeah. is uh that is quite logical steps that that i think everyone is trying to do that but the the problem with um, at home and robotics is like we're not able to we're not able to share much on the development i mean like even though we we we, we push a lot of effort on on open source and all those things but so far whatever that we can share is actually sharing technology for example like how to pro how to process certain data in order to get something how to detect something and, and so on but not up to the this is from my from my personal opinion okay so not up to the level that we can actually share behavior for example like in human we actually teach other uh, each and other complicated stuff for example like how to do cooking so cooking is a very complicated thing that we can actually share how to cook with another person okay but in robotics now in this cooking task what we can do is we actually only able to share with another robot how to grab for example like how to grab a cup how to do this how to how to take a bowl or how to identify the great ingredient so the level is different so we need actually a a bit more how to say higher level sharing for example like i i know there are many works out there framework out there to actually make the robot learn i, I don't know previously got a few bigger projects that um that make the robot behavior uh, or the robot able to learn from the cloud for example like you have a system you have a robot that learn how to pick this thing then you 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 how to say you share this skill with another robots but that also come to a problem that if you have different anatomy of the robots for example a like different platform so we have a diago then we have a fetch then we have a turtle board then we have other things which is they might physically different in terms of cap capability that is very hard because like human we all have the same anatomy i mean maybe larger and smaller but still we have the two arms and, and 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 the same sensory perception and so on so it's easier to share but for robot it's much more complicated in this sense uh and also we have different sensors uh resolution and different different kind of things so that actually make the sharing very hard but i think tiago is one of the very commonly used uh service robot in especially in i think like in europe i guess so Tiago was uh, Tiago I think is from Spain. So uh, in Euro, I think like many people are using Tiago. I I'm not sure like do you actually have some resources from the Tiago community? Do Do you have actually heard about that? No. <laughs> no right. Okay. Right. It doesn't matter because like um uh, uh, maybe I can share with you like for example I know the community that work on the Toyota HSR. Mm, you might heard about that right. Is another mm -hmm. robot platform that do or service robot. so they have a community that they they try to share their knowledge within the community to how like for example like this group know can make the platform uh, so to make the robots to do certain action or to do certain tasks and then they can share this thing and because of their their robot platform are quite identical so the sharing is more possible right so but that is some um, how to say in terms of physical skill sharing but uh just now i also saw like you use a lot of web api right uh for example like um i, I don't know your, your speech um, engine your your vision engine and so on a lot like the online stuff so um what do you how to say like can your robot still function if let's say suddenly it go offline do you have well, uh our speech server and our our servers are 
They are locally run. Okay, so yeah, locally, I, okay. right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But regarding what you're saying about um, sharing across platforms and stuff, mm-hmm. I think quite a bit of the stuff we have done, I think, could be applied to other, other robots. robots, like especially the vision uh, mm-hmm. stuff we have done, mm-hmm. because pretty much all the robots yeah, you know, have, have, the a same, cam- have the same camera. So yeah. Yeah. That would be something that's very easy to you know, share across different uh, platforms mm-hmm. to be compatible. I mean, I, I, I really appreciate because like you give a very detailed like how you actually, your strategy, how you do the perception and how you detect something and then how you do the behavior and that 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 thing is very useful for other teams to, to actually learn how you actually make the robot able to understand the environment and to tackle the task and so on. So I think like even without the code sharing, I think that kind of sharing is very useful for a lot of teams that have some fundamental on they understand like all the steps that how you achieve that and then based on how you your strategy to use all those tools in order to tackle the task because okay there there are, there are, there are two things like you have the technology but how to use the technology to solve the task is also uh, part of the development in the home and, and that is actually not easy because um, for example like how to like you you have um, algorithm to to detect the height to detect the color of the hair to detect and all this thing and there are, there are many for example like I can give you an example for example like the waving waving thing so a lot of people like uh, do the open pose find the thing and even I saw teams that just use image processing they just without any um, how to say it, skeleton tracking you just do image processing and, and it works. For example, like you're doing the, the people follow, right? The follower, follow me task. There are many, many um, techniques to do follower. There are many, actually. Um, for example, like the turtle bot just use the distance. The turtle bot don't even use any image information. I mean like color information. It just use the, the distance, uh, get the volume and then get a centroid and try to follow but of course that actually gives you a lot of problems for example like you can't differentiate between the person and also the environment uh, then there are, there are many like got very complicated um, um, teams that use the open pose to actually get the pose of a human and it even applies something that to learn that person so that you don't follow other person and, and so on so there are many techniques so this this follower task is actually a very classic at home task because like it, it exists for like 10 years I, I guess like if you dig out the at home rules 10 years back we already have the follower task so this actually um, show us that there are many techniques in um, at home development that can be how to say generated based on different technology for example like if you want to do um, follower with pure vision I think you can if you want to do, do it with pure laser laser based data you can also but you want to join them together you can also do something but uh, which one is better okay better in many sense we can do we can say better in terms of accuracy in terms of um, speed so those are the measurement in terms of result but got people also try to measure better in terms of computation for example like can you actually do this thing with the calculation that can run on a raspberry pi and things like that right so so there are many things that we can research on based on this kind of things and yeah it depends on which perspective you look on but i think at home or service robot actually give us as a researcher uh, a very rich background scenario to to look at the problem and also the technology that we have and how to utilize the technology for development in a lot of different perspectives so so that's why i i think this kind of development is a very how to say uh it's a very rich for research yeah we can do a lot of things with with this environment so um that is also like i link back to the question that i asked you like what motivates you like Maybe in, in this development, you will develop certain interests in certain domain. For example, like you might interested in, in image processing, for example, deep learning in whatever things, or you might interested in, 
in, in, in the speech interaction and so on. And eventually it will lead you to your research path or, or to your career path later on and so on. You, you, you never know, right? Yeah, but of course, um, for at home also, we actually talk about human robot interaction and there are actually a lot of psychology part of, about that. Just now we asked, uh, we, we talked about the, the dialogue design. Like, do you actually have, like you written that dialogue flow for, by Google. So do you actually um, think of how you want to make, what is the strategy when you talk to people? Strategy in the sense that how you want to get the information in the most efficient way. Like you, you have the coffee shop. So the task of the, the, the waiter or waitress uh, is to get the information of the order, right? But sometimes the guests might don't know what they want to order. So they ask for opinion, like what you recommend and things like that. So what is your strategy? Because if you don't have a, a good strategy, your, your, your robot might lose. Like, don't know how to answer or don't know how to question after that. Then you might want to do a guided one or just an open ended um, chatting because you are not going to design a robot that want to open end chat with the client in a coffee shop, right? You, you, you are not going to do that. So how you want to lead them to the question that the answer that you want and so on. So that is the, the dialogue uh, strategy and so on that. Yeah. And I think um, just now also, um, I link back to the question just now about this simulation thing. Uh, it is very nice that you show us a way that we can do all this development and research on the simulation world. So without actually uh, need a real Tiago in order to do that. Right. But um, just now I, I realized that when you're using pocket, okay, so one thing is like the, the pronunciation is not very clear. Uh, because like pocket spin, you need to like, because it's open source, so the voice quality is, yeah, you, you need to put a lot of effort in order to improve the voice, uh, the, the, the speech quality uh, in order to have some very nice voice and so on. Uh, but what I'm more concerned is like the clarity of the, of the, of the, of the voice. Like, um, because in your simulation, you are working with predefined script, right? So which mean the, the, the people inside there, okay, the simulated avatar inside there is supposed to talk something that you already designed. Have you ever think of like you can actually make um, random guests to talk to the robot? I mean, you have a real world human talk to a simulated version or simulation or uh, talk to a robot in a simulation environment. So um, because I involved in, in the simulation version of, of, of at home, I mean, like some uh, a lot of people actually work on that. And I involved in one of the, the projects that went off that. So uh, we also try think how we can use a simulation uh, platform in order to do experiment on real human robot interaction. Real human robot interaction over here is, I mean, the human response come from real human, not uh, a prescribed avatar. Well, at the moment, yeah, we are only using like a, yeah. a script basically we yeah. haven't really um used an actual uh like non-expert person to try and interact with something we've created mm -hmm. in simulation yet. yeah but obviously yeah. that is something that's quite important especially if we want yes. to you know like with our end goal being to make human interaction so easy mm -hmm. uh, at some point we need to have it so if someone comes to tiago and starts you know wants to interact with him mm -hmm. they don't, don't need to have any knowledge of the, you know, his internals, if you get yeah. what I mean. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, because especially like, for example, like in at home competition, <laughs> sometimes the referee or the judges might be a little bit mean <laughs> when talking <laughs> to the robots <laughs> because you want to test uh, how your robot respond to, to, to general public because general public might don't know how to talk to a robot actually. And, and that is actually a big research topic because um you, you know there's a conference called H, uh, hri right human robot interaction a big conference and that conference i can say that actually half of the conference are non-technical 
because they mo they they might study on on psychology, um, um, UI user interface. Um, they might study on on how about dialogue about all these things that is not related to like speech recognition. So, actually, in 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 this direction that you want to achieve a robot that can talk to the general public. There are actually many thing, many more non-technical stuff there that we need to consider. So that's why at home is very rich in this sense that it don't just represent uh, the technical stuff, like how you recognize speech, but also you yeah. need to have the strategy to talk to the person in order to get the information that you want. And especially when your opponent is not really cooperating with you, <laughs> you, you know, right? When when you're asking something yeah. and that person is not answering you according to what you want, then it might be very confusing for for the robots, and that is actually very important topic in human robot interaction. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you you want to make your robot able to talk to general public. So yeah, the the intelligent over there. So that is what I call the intelligent in terms of communication, and even human talk to human, we have a lot of problem, <laughs> right? We have a lot of problem in communication and so on. So, uh, robot is nothing less than that. So, if you if you are using robots, it actually adds up the complexity because the robot don't have the human intelligence yet to to actually come until the level that understand what the human try to say. In but of course, uh, we understand that when human talk to robots and when human talk to human, they behave differently. Uh, that is proven in a lot of papers. I I I know in and even got research paper talk about the appearance of the robot will actually influence how the people talk to the robots. So that's why you might want to put some effort to make the sound of the robot more comfortable. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but currently how it say might be a bit too robotics. Yeah, yeah. There there, there are many research on on the speech that. Now they can make the sound very human-like, and and, mm -hmm. and that actually because I got one research student who's worked on this, and she study about um, how to actually ask question, the same question but when you ask differently, uh, differently not just in terms of your voice, but in terms of your speed and in terms of your pitch, in terms of how and in terms of the word that you use, might actually give you different results. So, yeah, because so, uh, yeah. the robot just, uh, you know, it just synthesizes the speech. There's no yeah. like intonations or uh, placing any accents or anything. It just it's... says the words you want it to say. Yeah, and, and I think like pocket spin is not that flexible in terms of all these parameters that you can do. You can't do much on the speeds and so on. From, from, my, from my knowledge, from my understanding is you can't actually play much on the, on the speech. Like you can't make the robot talk slower. Not easy. I mean, yeah. not to say totally cannot, but it's not easy to do that, right? But yeah, these are all the research things that you can do. Well, um, very nice um, sharing session today and we talked a lot and, and okay. So before I go to the closing, I would like to ask you, uh, can, can you like please tell uh, or, or share with us like um, what you want to tell for, for people that would like to do something like you for example like now you have a junior that come in and say okay uh, what is the word that you're going to tell them uh, in order for them to feel motivated to do things that you have done yeah yeah as, as a final closing so please share uh, a sentence or, or, or any things that you would like to pass to a newcomer uh, and please, uh, one more thing. Oh, okay, uh, okay, we have one question, All right? So, yeah, so yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to know that uh, what is uh, your routine? I mean, are you, uh, because you said you are uh, in your undergrad degree, so how are you managing the, your subjects and uh, how much time are you spending on this uh, robotic development? Or uh, And uh, one more thing, that uh, for how long has this robot been in development? And uh, are you working in the supervision of some PhD professor or uh, you are working in some uh, robotic club out of your university? Thank you so much. Okay, uh, okay so in reply to that question, we haven't really um, worked 
uh, on the robot alongside our studies because our studies have been halted for the past however many months due to the pandemic. So we've just had free time basically. We haven't had any uh, actual work to do for university. So we won't really see how we balance it, I guess is what you're asking, until next year when we go back and we start learning again. And then in regards to, I think you asked if we're under supervision from like PhD student. Um, well, in our team, there, as you said at the start, we have this hierarchy of like mental. So there's, you know, PhD down to undergraduate and, you know, obviously the more senior members are supervising and mentoring us younger members. So I suppose, yeah, we are under supervision from uh, PhD students as well. I hope that answers your question. Yes, and the duration, uh, for how long has this robot been in development, the robot that you are working on? So how long have you had this robot? Uh, that's what you said. Sorry? I am actually asking about uh, the duration, that uh, for how long uh, has this robot been in development, that you are continuously working to improve it, it the features, its vision, and uh, for how long has this robot been in development? Uh, well, internally, I don't know about from actual like PAL, the robotics company, I make the robot, but within our team, uh, it's around one year, I believe, like actually continually, you know, developing our system that we use on the actual robot. It's around one year. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. All right. So let's come to the end. So before I, I go into like closing the session, that I have another two slides to, to, to some announcement to make. So I would like to say thanks to you and would like to invite you to just say a word for the new beginner. I mean like, um, you try to say something that motivate the newcomer for, or people that, that look that, that watching this video. Uh, do you have any message to them to motivate them to uh, do something that you have done or something that you are doing? Um, mm -hmm. New students always uh, want to get their hands on the robot right away, and it's uh, the reality. It's not like that. Um, mm -hmm. So you, first of all, uh, be consistent on creating a solid base, and that's all you need to then start uh, testing all your uh, applications on the actual robot. It's very fun uh, to manipulate a robot and even uh, figuring out on your own uh, using open source uh, uh, stuff. I think it's pretty fun. And when you work with people, uh, you actually learn to double. Uh, uh, and I don't know, it's it's fun, I believe. OK, right. And, and I would say, um, as we said at the start, uh, so you look at like a, an undergraduate, a new student, mm -hmm. and people think, oh, you know, you won't be able to do a lot like in regards to, you know, programming a robot. But in reality, once you have the basics down, uh, so from the ROS tutorials or whatever, or what we learned from the uh, at home lectures, after that, uh, you know, you're set to go. Like we talked about a lot of different technologies in here, mm -hmm. but in reality, you don't need all these from the start. You know, as you go along, you're going to be learning these new technologies and applying them. So you don't need to know them from the beginning, just the basics, basically. All right. Thank, thanks a lot for, for your nice word and thanks for your presentation. And I think like today's session actually give a lot of insight about how you guys actually do all the development in simulation and it works. And, and that is actually very amazing. I mean, this video record will be very useful as a reference later on for me to tell a lot of people that you can actually build the robots or do this development even without robots. Okay, right. So yeah. let me go to my slides uh, as a clue for oh, I need to stop sharing, I think. Yep, okay, so I'll take over. Hopefully, you're right. Okay. Right, so thanks a lot. Right, thanks a lot for, for, for your, how to say, thanks for your presentation today. I really appreciate and hopefully like uh, wish you all the best for your development and also for next year competition and hope to see you uh, at the at home uh, competition or in RoboCup, okay? 
Okay. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for having thank us. You. Yeah. Thanks thank you. Much. Right. So um uh before I I I close the session, Joe. So just uh, as a reminder that. Uh, this video will be uploaded to our social media account and also will put on our website. So just in case that you need to know the links, so these are all the links. Our website, our Facebook group, just in case that you want to know our development. We have a lot of announcement made uh, in our Facebook page and also group. So uh, do like our page and also join our group so that you can get the information. And also we share all the materials, for example, like the videos and all those things we will, we will share over there. And you can actually interact with us uh, through the Facebook group, okay? And we, we try to gather all the things, uh, all the source code or open source thing, and then uh, we we put it nicely in, on our GitHub. So if you want um, uh, to test on the example, uh, especially those that um, we conducted in our, our online classroom or whatever workshops, so all the open source code is available uh, on our GitHub um, account. Then, of course, like you, if you want to refer back to our online classes uh, materials, that is the, our online classroom um, link. And lastly, if uh, you have things that you want to ask us that is, you can't find the information on our website or whatever resources that you can find, feel free to write, write us an email. Okay, so the OC, it will go to our OC uh, and, and then we will, we will try to feed back to you. Okay. So thanks a lot everyone for joining today and um, we, we still got one more for this uh, special online challenge 2020 invited lecture series. We still got one more uh, to go at the end of September. So please um, remember to check out the link and also uh, register for the for the next um, invited lecture series, right? And for all the previous um, uh, lectures, you can find the information uh, partic particularly on the on, on the slides and also on the video and if there are any um, materials that that they share for example like open source code we will also put a link there so uh, please make sure that you you how to say uh, access to that that link right so with that I would like to say thanks and thanks um, team LASR uh, uh, from University of Leeds and, and thanks for all of you uh, joining us today and with that I would like to close this session. Thank you very much. See Thank you. you so much. See you a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.